Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Valenti, and I'm joined today by the wonderfully talented Suki Smith. You're you're in London. You're in uh, London right now. Tough loss for England in the World Cup. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I sort of didn't watch that just because I felt sort of a bit kind of complex about the fact it was being played in such a peculiar place um, in terms of human rights, etc. But yeah, I, I guess it. I didn't realize quite how upset all my friends were going to be that weekend, but they were pretty moody. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. normally do watch the World Cup, but I just haven't this time. Just, I don't know. It doesn't, I'm sure, make any difference to anything, but just the side of me just finds that too difficult to watch the fact it's there, but there we are. Yeah, yeah. But yes, so yeah, people are a bit upset. I think people are upset. I went to see my friend Adam Franklin, who is in the band Swerve Driver on Sunday, and uh, and I was like, "What's the matter?" You know, blah blah blah. Talking to him, he just seemed a bit down. And I went, well, actually, you know, England not being in the World Cup is kind of like, and I've forgotten that it really means a lot to some people. But yeah, so it's a weird, it's a weird, it's a weird unifying thing, isn't it? In some ways, but also kind of pushes people aside and makes you sort of tribal in a weird way, which you didn't realize you kind of might be anyway. Yes. So yes, thank you for your commiserations, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so I, I have some friends who were getting a really into the fact that, that uh, the United States was in the world cup and I, I, and I love sports, but I, I didn't even watch a game. I just, I, I honestly, yeah. no, I didn't care to be honest. <laughs> And it's weird that Italy isn't in at all, at all. You know, that's kind of yeah. like, I just remember Italy as being sort of like, you know, the great sort of like footballing nation in some ways, as well as England. But, you know, Italy definitely, and they're not playing at all. So it all seems a bit odd, but there we are. And I hope everyone is enjoying it if they're watching it. And that's, you know, that's the important thing, isn't it? Maybe, and maybe being where it is, maybe makes people sort of aware of some things not being okay and, parts of the world that they didn't maybe know about so maybe maybe it's doing its job in a different way that I let's dive a bit in, into your background now you know you're very successful with both your music and your acting which you know which department would you say was your first love out of those two well I think um that you know as a way of kind of changing my life I think as I grew up I just saw acting as one way or another as sort of like escape from what was perhaps expected from where I was brought up, not particularly my family who were very, um, you know, pro arts and uh, very uh, encouraging of music, drama, everything creative. But, you know, the place I grew up was basically on a commuter line to go into London. If you were sharp or smart, you basically went into London to work. Um, I grew up in Essex. You went to London to work in the city. And there's a kind of sort of like, um, I just, I, I, I suppose my experience of sort of like anybody that wasn't kind of doing something like that was maybe the, to look towards acting. You know, that seemed to me to be glamorous, bohemian, interesting, and a way out of that sort of like possible life. But, you know, always in my sort of secret life, I'd written writing poetry and kind of thinking about music. And, you know, if I had any sort of like dreams of success and stuff, it was actually music, but I didn't act on that at all, just without not really having any sort of like direct um, knowledge of how that might happen. Even though, you know, my father, I think, played in jazz bands and stuff, but it was all kind of muted and quiet. And he, he basically became a banker to look after his family. So acting was definitely the first thing I did and left London, uh, left um, Essex to go to drama school. And then, you know, just did that pretty much full time, not thinking about um, music, but, always writing just writing 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 what what are lyrics really so um i sort of this i know i'll do this several times in our conversation where i will forget what you asked me but i think you asked me what is my first laugh but it, it, you know it, one came for, before the other but i i wouldn't i'd say now you know the fact that you know i've released these three albums i've done lots of tours etc and collaborated and song and done a lot of songwriting i'd say what i'm doing now which is to bring the two disciplines together in some sort of like performative um creative environment where you know it's a bit it's a bit freer and it's a bit more than a song an album it's spoken word it's a kind of um amalgamation of both that feels very correct now so sort of to bring them together which was they were secret from each other for a long time 
I didn't tell anybody that as an actress that I had a band and I certainly didn't tell my band that I tried. It was sort of pre-internet. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but it's like where people could barely, you could keep things secret. So yeah, that was kind of, it was funny. But then sort of like, there was such a sort of like um, prejudice against actors making music in some ways. And then that changed because of American actors like Bonnie Prince Billy and, uh, you know, people like Tom Waits, Iggy Pop, you know, they were sort of they're kind of doing projects as themselves, but as themselves with the notoriety of their music. That was kind of, it sort of helped change everything. And then, yeah, I don't know what I'm rambling on about, but yes, um, everything is everything in that respect. Everything creative becomes the same thing, but yeah. Who would you say were your favorite music artists growing up? I grew up with a lot of jazz being played in the house and I sort of rejected it, but I think it's probably what I am most influenced by. So that was like Bessie Smith, Billie Holiday, Fats Domino, etc. But I think when I chose to sort of like find music that I wanted to listen to, I mean, David Bowie, Kate Bush, Joan Armour Trading, her songs just were kind of like astonishing to me. The Roaches, um, you know, so yeah, growing up, I think those people that had sort of a narrative in their songs, as well as being really beautiful to listen to, I think I was really drawn to that. So that's also maybe a connection to kind of like, you know, acting and, and storytelling maybe. So those definitely. And, and still, you know, but Kate Bush and David Bowie, I still think of really, and Jane, Joan Armstrong, was astonishing. But then kind of, you know, exploring things, uh, musicians like Neil Young and just loving the sound that they make. Uh, um, yeah. Oh, yeah, just you end up spinning off and thinking about music without being able to kind of talk about it. But yeah, so those are the people I think that were kind of, you know, the initial sort of like, and and music and and soundtracks as well. We had a, a library around the corner from our house where we used to just go and borrow soundtracks of film. So, like, you know, any any Morricone for a start. Uh, you know, all those sort of spaghetti western sort of like soundtracks. Actually, I've not actually thought that before. That's true. Like all of the music from the sort of films that we'd heard about we didn't kind of go to a lot of things or yeah so that yes that that's um what my first music palette was uh, well, well that's that, that that's great you, you 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 mentioned a lot of great names i was very happy to hear you mention kate bush and i think it's great that i think people from this generation are finding more about her music just because of the whole stranger things you know that, yeah. that I, I think it's great that people are finding her music from, you know, my generation, which is great. And that astonishing song, you know, that is just all those tribal drums and all of the kind of, yeah, really clever to kind of like, whoever put, placed that in the, in that series, is just like very clever. So, well, you know, it's inspired, yeah. Yeah, it's funny, it's brilliant. As soon as you make music, it exists forever. You know, the, the legacy element of your outpouring is just, it's a, uh, it's a no brainer to kind of think that actually things will live on. And, you know, everyone's kind of like lamenting at the moment about Angelo Bablimenti. That's how you say it, isn't it? That's how the guy from to who wrote all the music for David Lynch. Yeah, but it's kind of like, I am sad for him that his life on earth isn't, um, doesn't exist anymore, but all of his music forever and ever, is just like always with us. Yeah, Do you, have you ever, yeah. I missed a chance to see Kate Bush do her extraordinary um, sort of big theatrical um, performance. Actually, she's so great, isn't she? She's just, have, do you listen to her? Had you listened to her before you were aware yeah, of her? Yeah, from, yeah, yeah. She's yeah, just yeah, astonishing. Just a wonderful artist, wonderful. Just a wonderful artist. The way she thinks about sound and, and the sonic experience of sort of soundtrack and soundscape and not not finding those as different genres just all being on her record is just yeah just really rewarding isn't it to listen to just time over again are you still there oh yeah yeah so that's 
that's them <laughs> yeah yes yes of course and 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 and, and we will we, when we will definitely uh, get get back to 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 talking more about music and just obviously this great stuff that you've been making right now i want to talk a bit about about your your acting stuff that we mentioned earlier uh let's talk about one of your most famous roles uh uh the the witches from in uh, 1990 um you know where you're playing the maid at the hotel and of course, you share the screen with the great Rowan Atkinson. Uh, how did you land that role? Yeah, how did I land that role? Well, so I left drama school, got a nice, good agent. And then just one day she was like, you have to go and meet these people. And I was like, oh, I think I've heard of that director. And, and it's a really big casting director. And, um, and I walked into the casting. So it's through an agent. So yeah, that's the simple answer. But I walked in and the casting director, Celestia Fox, and Nick Rogue are both sitting with really dark glasses, really a doer just behind this desk. And I said, I'm not coming in because you're too frightening. Until you take your sunglasses off, I'm not coming in. And they both had really bad hangovers. But yeah, it was just a normal audition. But I think the fact that I was a bit feisty with them and demanded that I saw their eyes before I even walked in the room, I think probably appealed to Nick Rogue, who was absolutely fantastic. He's as extraordinary as you think he might be having looking, looking at his films and stuff, yeah. So that's how I got that. Just straightforward, traditional sort of like drama school agent. Agent puts you up for things. Casting directors want new people. And then, yeah, and it was really astonishing. Actually, um, I got the job, but I was also doing another job at the time. I was doing a job at the time, understudying um, a big West End play. And my agent was really clever. I wouldn't have done this because there was an overlap. And she was like, don't worry, they'll push the filming back. But it looked like I should say no to the film. But she was like, nope we'll definitely say yes to the film. We won't mention the fact that you're working and it would be impossible for you to do this job. I know this will get pushed back because films always do. So thank <laughs> Sorry, am I allowed to swear on your podcast? Oh, you're. <laughs> but it, 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 it's completely okay. <laughs> completely fine. So yeah. It, so then we were all, um, we were filming up in Bray, which is in, out, just outside of London. And, and all the actors that had those kind of parts that were in and around the hotel, were just sitting around in their costumes and their makeup waiting to see if they needed them, which they didn't because they were really behind. So we just had a brilliant time. Rowan Atkinson sat in his car because we were all probably quite annoying. We were all these young actors out of drama school, really sort of hyper. And he was like not having any of it. So he sat in his big red Ferrari or whatever it was. And Angelica Houston teased him a lot. She just teased him about probably having a nanny. because she, she was fab so fabulous. She's exactly what you want from a leading lady. So just be, so to make a silhouette in the door and just be like, la, la, la. Anyway, she was great. It was a really lovely experience, actually, working on that film. And, um, and I know, it's just so, so popular, isn't it? Just this yeah. extraordinary film. And, uh, and it goes into, I think, when, did you watch it when you were? Oh, yes. Up as a yes. Child? Yeah. So, you know, it's, I, I don't realise, you know, having sort of not had that experience, but it's like, I went once into some, you know, difficult little phone shop somewhere to get something sorted with my phone. And um, and when the other customers had gone out, the guy in there was really cool. And he was just like, oh my God, oh my God, you're my favorite actress. <laughs> so, what, do you mean me? And then it was from that film and he just wanted to know all about what, you know, what it was like and gave me a really good deal on my phone. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. So yeah, no, that, that I know that film doesn't go away either. That's that's still kind of like, even though the remake, I felt quite sort of like it was interesting to think about that remake. Was it was it with Anne Hathaway? Have you seen yep, that? Yep, yep, yes, yep. What? How does it compare? Yeah, yeah, it's it's like I didn't think it was bad or anything, but 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 to me, the original always always is going to be the best. The original is just it's so frightening as well. If I yeah. watch it now and the whole sort of like disappearing thing with the pictures and the. Yeah, just scary. Anyway, it, it was brilliant. And uh, they actually, um, they somebody got it wrong when they were scheduling sort of like costumes and stuff. They assumed I was part of the group of um, witches that needed to kind of transform with wigs and um, teeth and everything. So I had to go for this stupid set of, set of all things where you had to get all those false teeth fitted and contact lenses and something else. And then they were like, oh, sorry about that. No, you didn't have to do any of that. That was, yeah, that was quite extraordinary how much transformation there was in that film. Brilliant. 
Yeah, you 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 know, like like you mentioned, it's pretty crazy how, how the the film, you know, you know, it I think it really holds up today and it has such such an endear an enduring fan base, I would say. You know, it's like people still watch it to this day. Yeah, and it's on all the time. I don't know if it's shown much in the US, but it's like it will be on at Christmas somewhere on one of the channels. You know, it just seems to be a yearly thing. Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm not surprised though. I mean, those books, those Roald Dahl books are kind of, they've got enough kind of horror in them in some ways to sort of like, you know, outrun any sort of, I, I, sort of, sort of anything to be too young, you know, people, there's always something in them that kind of like hooks people in. Yeah, and it's funny, all those things, looking at the, the English actors that are in that and where they've gone and what they've done. And Rowan Atkinson, well, that's just extraordinary. He sat next to me in the makeup room and um, sort of just sat next to getting his makeup done. He turned around and he said, oh, our characters are having an affair. And the way he said it made me really bluff. <laughs> <laughs> He's got real power about him. <laughs> But he wasn't the big star he is now when he when he played that part. He was just in a, I think, a sort of sketch show, and that was his where his fame had come from. I think I don't. He definitely hadn't done Mr. Bean or anything like that. Pretty extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah it's 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 kind of crazy, you know. I, I I I can imagine for you looking back at that and, and just being like being like, wow, you know, I I got to. You know, you know, you you got to share the screen, share many scenes, scenes with the with an icon of uh, of comedy. It's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty cool, I would say. Yeah, he was lovely. You know, that everyone was lovely on that um, set. Um, yes, everyone. There was, I guess, the scenes. Yes, I was mostly in scenes with him. I guess wasn't I? But yeah, they they it was. Um, you know, the main the character on the on the set was Nick Rogue. He was. You know, we were all in awe of what he had made, and you know, we all had seen his films, and just has had such a presence about him without, in any way, being dominating. He just was, you know, on set. His sons, I think, were working in production as well, so they were around, sort of like running. And I think one of them was a third assistant or something. But yeah, it was definitely a very kind of tightly run ship. But at the same time, with sort of celebration of creativity, Nick Rogue was sort of, if you did something that made him laugh, he'd be like, oh, do it again. He'd be like, oh, I'll do it again. <laughs> Might only be, so he was clever, just kind of like finding little idiosyncrasies within people's performances. And uh, yeah, really, it was a really good experience. I just, qu I quickly want to mention another film that you're in th that I think your performance is great in, uh, Lawless Heart. This, I think this movie deserves way more uh, way more attention your performance is, is is so great you play it with such energy but you know it's you're you're funny in it but you know you have this great sense of humility as well i would say with your character it's just a, it's a really great performance that you gave in this film thank you i think that is the, the character that i that feels closest you know because we worked so long on that film it was it came out of a series of improvisations around one of the directors house for years you know we would kind of they would go around and sort of like I was working mainly with James Dreyfus actually which is I don't think many people know that but he he was the main he was meant to be the character that I play opposite who which ended up being Tom Hollander and um so but I did all this improvisation work with um James Dreyfus um and so if, uh, as they tried to raise money for the film you know they were but they were they were writing it so it, we sort of gave what we could to them. I, mean, I don't think that I kind of invented any of that script particularly because it was just, you know, a, a year's worth of improvisation and scenes that they set up. But yeah, you can't help but really be invested in that character because it becomes a part of you or you are it, except I know that it, it isn't me play on, on the screen. It's, you know, the character of Charlie. And it's really odd when you come to do something like do the dubbing afterwards if something has gone wrong with sound and you need to kind of just fix something or another or that you know the audio needs some help and realized I spoke really differently I thought maybe I was just like the character but she she I mean I as her this character just I knew it was a kind of big characterization because it was quite difficult to um to get back into the rhythm of the way she spoke and uh 
Yeah, so, oh, and I'm really happy to hear that you like that film. I, I absolutely love that film. I just think it, it kind of bubbled around, sort of like nearly getting a big awards. It was shortlisted, for, longlisted for a lot of things, including BAFTAs, and, uh, and I think that it did really well in America. But, you know, there's a lot of things at play, you know, to sort of push a film, and it's not just necessarily on its merits. So... I mean, I don't know what happened back, you know, behind the scenes, but it's like, yeah, it got somewhere just because it was what it was. But then I think the real big shove over the line so that you, everybody knows about it at the awards is, is a, a whole other game, which wasn't part of it, I guess. We had a brilliant time. We took it to New York. Um, I think I think um, Tom Hollander and Bill Nye were like upset that it didn't have more of it. They, they really believed in the film, rightly so. And so they organised through... Sam Mendes, a big screening in New York. And then it was like, you can't see it now, but it's like the, the biggest snowstorm happened in New York on the day that we were, met, the evening that we were meant to be having this screening. But we still came, all of us, we, you know, we were like, I went to New York. Um, Sam Mendes was, uh, was, I think, married or going out with Kate Winslet. She was there, it was like Saffron Burrows. We just really tried to kind of like give this film some sort of like, um, uh, what's the right word? Just some sort of like profile in in America, but it was reviewed beautifully there. And uh, you know, they, I, anyway, yes. So thank you for saying that. And I agree. All the interwoven narratives were really interesting to me as well. And I think we were all so invested. The people that kind of like uh, had been there from the start, which was mainly the women characters. So Ellie Haddington and Joe Butler, who are the other two women who are you know one of us in each storyline really kind of invested in the how much uh what we we did whatever we could to kind of like get that film seen by as many people as possible we also did the um commentary on the when the director gets to talk about well the director didn't get a word in edgeways there were two directors they're so lovely so it was the three of us just talking over all of the scenes telling the behind the scenes stuff have you have you listened to any of that it really makes me laugh i can't believe they allowed it to go out <laughs> oh i i haven't been able to listen to that i have to check that out absolutely and it's in some on some of the dvds there's a kind of director's sort of like commentary but it's actually the three of us just talking over neil and tom <laughs> That worked really strangely well, actually, to have two directors because they'd conceived of the whole project and wrote it together. But then they were also on set directing together. And that was, that was, it kind of split so that Neil Hunter would talk mainly about shot angles and camera and stuff, but also some kind of little, he'd come up and just say some sort of like really sort of like pertinent, strange thing that would kind of like be secret to anybody else. And Tom Hunsinger was there sort of, kind of giving the whole thing maybe a sort of like steer in the way that they wanted but because we'd improvised it or well, the three women had improvised it for so long it was um it was all quite instinctive yeah wild yeah yes am yeah. i talking too much sorry no 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 worries at all <laughs> no worries at, at all but, but yeah that's you know it's just one of that is one of my uh, favorite performances by you, and 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 uh, like I said, you just do a wonderful job uh, with it. But Thank you. Uh, it, that character meant something to people as well. I think I remember being at a party, and this girl worked out that I was her, and she just she was just I don't know. She was really she was I don't know what feelings she was had, but she was just cuddling me and having a really big cry, and it was like oh, yeah, it's all right. But I kind of understood that character has got sort of like such kind of awkwardness and confusion, but then empathy and um, yeah, and you kind of go with her through her sort of uh, romance that goes wrong, you know, and sort of like that kind of like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> Terrible sort of like face of that we've all maybe been through. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, so, 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 so let's let's go back to talking uh, about about the great music that you make. You know, you you have your band, Madam. How did the, how did Madam come to be? How, how how was the band formed? Yeah. Um, so I how was it formed? I kind of had played bass, but only in a rehearsal room for a couple of people, and I'd written 
songs, but secretly, you know, without any ability to, I'd written songs on, the first song I ever wrote was Horses, which is on In Case of Emergency, I think. Um, but just on a bass, just two notes on a bass and written it. And someone that I was seeing heard it and they were like, oh, there's some merit in that. You should maybe push that along. So, so I kind of maybe wrote a handful of songs actually. And then, you know, a brilliant, brilliant friend of mine insisted that I made a demo and uh, it was actually in this flat and it was so horrible. It was such a terrible experience because it was something I'd obviously really wanted to do and found it so unbearable that it was actually coming into some kind of fruition because you're dealing with just an enormous amount of like expectation and feeling and I didn't know what I was doing but this person was like do it this is how we go and this is next and then just on a little four track so that I that is probably one of the, the most generous things anyone's ever done is just kind of like you know, make, it's like your, I was a magnet being pushed against another magnet. You know, that sort of like, no, 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 no. And then suddenly the magnets twist and you're like, oh, okay, it makes some sense now. But it's, uh, yeah. And then from there, it, I was able to put a band together with the help of my friend who, you know, basically worked with musicians from a band called The Rocking Birds who were just local Camden musicians. And that's how it all started. And then kind of started to play shows and it evolved. And then there's just been like this rolling review of, brilliant musicians that I've managed to get to play with me <laughs> quite know have done it but I'm like oh yes he did and he did and oh yes she did so yeah that's how it started and also thinking about not calling it my name was a conscious thing just not wanting to kind of overlap with any of my acting life which was you know that was a much bigger profile than music at the time so yeah that's how it started that's so awesome you know how 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 you how how you've been able able to have, have all these artists come in and like and you're and able to uh you're able to collaborate with them and and make this music i i think that is that's a really cool element yes i do well thank you and i'm lucky i agree but i also kind of sort of went into some sort of like mindset where i didn't notice how great they were apart from the fact of what they were playing i didn't kind of get over it didn't occur to me that these great musicians that were lauded everywhere were coming to play on my records. I didn't think about it as a kind of kudos thing. I was just like, oh, right, you. Oh, yeah, that sounds good, 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 good. Really nerdy and, like, just kind of in the sound and not thinking, you know, but then I, I, meant, I, I went to a party and I was talking to somebody about, you know, I was trying to sort of encourage them to sign my band and then they were like, well, who's in your band? And... And I sort of said, and then he went, oh, it's like a super group. And I thought, oh, what a twat I sound like. <laughs> but it was just who was around, you know. It was, yeah, no, very good luck to um, play my simple songs, to have these lovely, brilliant people play on them. Definitely. And, and me, me not let them play what they wanted sometimes. It's like, no. <laughs> you may have released millions of albums and got thousands of fans, but no, not right. <laughs> but I think you need a kind of benign dictator in a band. If it's too kind of like a, too of a collective, I don't know, it maybe loses its way. I think those bands that say they're a collective, they're lying. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that's how it started. From this flat, actually, which is, I'm not normally here, but that's funny, yeah. It's funny thinking about your history being in one room. I guess the flat where you're at right now, I guess that makes it pretty historic, I guess, right? This is the historic flat where everything has happened. Yeah. Well, yeah, from all the times where you're sort of running out from, for auditions, lots of stuff is done online now, but if you, you know, you, there was a kind of like, it was good being here in Camden because we were in London in 20 minutes. And, you know, you'd be on two or three castings a day, maybe, with all demanding different looks and <laughs> coming back and changing and, and then or going to town with like loads of different outfits to sort of like change to be a Victorian maid in something and then you know businesswoman over there and I don't yeah it's kind of like hilarious funny life but yes from this flat yeah now now so, so and also and I just want to say this when I'm listening to your music you know personally I feel I you know I find it very 
thought-provoking, very creative, creative. And I feel like you take inspiration from, from a variety of genres, but how, how would you personally describe your music? I think um, that that's true. I'm sure I do take inspiration from things that I've absorbed, but I don't do it consciously, which sometimes is difficult when you're in a studio. Sometimes it's hard to articulate what you mean. And a shortcut is to say, it's a bit like this bass line from this track and, you know, when a vibe of the 60s, blah, blah, blah. And none of that sort of resonates with me. I have to answer the narrative of the song. And then the, and my ambition for a song when I first start it is to articulate something that I can't articulate either because of the subject matter or because I haven't worked out, you know, exactly what I'm what I'm feeling or meaning or, or have observed. So the song is a way of doing that and to explore kind of murky or, you know, just a sort of delicate part of life that isn't something that you can talk about necessarily. So sonically and with the sort of sound of the music, it has to be to illustrate that really. And not that anyone else might know that, but the integrity of the song relies on me thinking what it is that I feel is going on in the narrative of the song and what ingredients sonically, musically, will just enhance that. That all sounds quite, quite clinical. It's very instinctive. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's kind of, I mean, I guess I sort of write thinking that a band might play it, but the most recent set of music songs I've done, I've, it was all the way through COVID so, and lockdown. So there was no access to musicians other than you know, me and the studio engineer who would play a bit of bass maybe, and, but everything else was made with equipment from the studio, not, not in a rehearsal room, not rehearsed, you know, synth based, soundscape based, which when I played it to a couple of people, they were like, oh, what a change of direction. And it maybe is a change of direction, but it was just what was needed to kind of, you know, make sense of the drama of the song. So, and again, I've forgotten what you asked me, <laughs> but that is why, that's how I approach music is, Definitely to, to, to try and articulate, which is always good, isn't it? When you stumble over the word articulate, to try and, um, <laughs> to try and kind of reinforce what the song maybe is exploring. And, and also as a counterpoint to maybe what the song is exploring, you know, sort of like just to kind of, just to sort of just have a big sort of scope of, um, the, you know, most things, it, it, most things have most things in them. That's so stupid what I just said, but you know, it's like every happy feeling is, you know, there's based on other stuff, sadness and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> so yeah, that's, but thank you for listening to it, for listening to it. That's very lovely to know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, it's because 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 whenever I'm listening to cheer music and I, and I and 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 I think you know overall your music it's a really great mixing of, of just of, of just of a bunch of like of, of a bunch of different sounds. It's it's these it's it's kind of like pieces in a puzzle. I would say that really come together and. And I honestly, I, I love your vocals as, as well. You know, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what your personal thoughts on on you know on your singing voice is, but I I love it. Thank you. I was really shy of singing, even though you know, as life as an actress, etc. I just kind of thought people would think I was sort of showing off or whatever. So for a long while, I sang really quietly. And the first album I recorded with Chris Clark, who's a fantastic bass player, musician, and um, he just had this 16 track in his one of the rooms in his little flat, but he's just had a newborn baby. So a lot of it is really quiet just because we were like, sure, it's the baby. So um, thank you. I think my vocal is kind of like one way or another is emerging. So this new set of songs, it's definitely, it's uh, when I play live, I can really, you know, sing, but like loudly and uh, make a big noise. But recording wise, I've always kind of felt shy. And also the nature of the songs have been more introspective maybe. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting what stands in, not the way, but the, how decisions are made about music and, you know, and sort of 
performance from me as the singer and it was very interesting going to real world when we um, recorded basically an album basically live apart from the vocals and a, the guitar overdubs we recorded gone before Mor morning there and that was it was very interesting to kind of be so concentrated on every aspect of it and n not allow anything that I hadn't already processed through my mind. I don't know what I'm talking about now, but I mean, I, I know what I mean, but um, it all sounds a bit rambly, but but thank you anyway. <laughs> oh, for saying it sounded good. It's complex to, for me to make music. It's not like something, I've just been reading um, a music biography by a sort of friend of mine and a, just, sort of some of the way they are able to very quickly make music is is impressive and and I'm sure the music is no less in, evolved and in, involved it, I just don't know how they do it that fast you know this like go in and accept that baff, 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 ding, 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 ding. it's like I don't know it's like it's like painting I guess it's it's a huge process for me to make sound it's really odd not having made sound properly in the world for you know five years it's like a long time not having any sort of like music to kind of explain or justify or, or just know that people are listening to it's, i don't know i don't think i've kind of fallen off the edge of the earth but anyway but yeah blah blah much like the way i'm trying to answer any of your questions <laughs> it's completely <laughs> in a roundabout way i might get to the answer <laughs> hey, well, 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 hey, I, I really appreciate the fact that they're going uh, so in detail. I, I appreciate that. Um, well, let's see, when when can we expect maybe some new music, uh, you know, in the future, perhaps? Well, it's, it's, it's nearly there, you know. I just have made seven tracks and I was thinking, and they they do sound very different. They are studio based and they're quite dramatic and they've sonically they're sometimes they're quite huge which I really am satisfied with I think that's very exciting for me but um yeah I'm just wondering how to do it whether to approach labels or to to release it myself I mean that seems kind of like quite a, a satisfying way to do it actually you sort of like really I mean the internet's so genius you know that you can find everybody so, um, so I would say early next year, there will definitely be a new track in the world and it won't, won't be a madam track. It will be me because I think it would be inauthentic to say that it was our band. It doesn't mean madam doesn't exist anymore, but I just think this has a different sound and a different perspective. And it, it, most of madam's music is, is mine, but I certainly wouldn't have come up with the instrumentation of all of it it was all me kind of guiding people, but not specifically, not saying, well, not always, but sometimes I'd say this is the exact baseline, but mostly it was me sort of like trying to kind of like create a sort of atmosphere within which people would be free to sort of play amongst us, you know, with, our, with what became quite a tight knit band and create these soundscapes that they did, especially on Gone Before Morning, which I think is, it's it's that is a collective sound that it, which I I really appreciate and um, I'm very respectful of the the skill of everybody making that sound like that in five days. But yeah, this other set of music is um, is not that. So yeah, I'll call. It, I think I will use my name as well. I think it will be Suki Smith. So there's no hiding now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 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 I, I, well, I absolutely uh, cannot, cannot wait to, uh, to, to, he to hear that new music. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to hear that. Thank you. Yes, I am. It would be, it'd be interesting to see how, if anyone notices it's out. It's really odd with the, what happened with England is like Brexit, you know, I, we used to go to Italy all the time and play. We had a big following in Italy. I wonder if they will notice now, you know, because we can't get there as easily. Yeah, just we'll see. It's a whole brave new world and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Lastly, I I, I, I want to get your take on this. You know what? What advice you know do you have for aspiring actors or musicians? I I really am clear about it. It's don't wait 
don't wait for permission don't wait for anything you know if you're if you've got a band or you've got you know you're whatever make music put on shows do things online make videos do it do it do it and collaborate with as many of your creative peers as you can and the same with acting you know it's like it's a really interesting world where something like um you know there's a lot of women have done this because there's there's less work so they've written their own series they've made their own things low budget low budget you know it doesn't matter and then then all of a sudden it's people are taking credit for it by saying they commissioned this that and the other but it doesn't matter it's just like as a creative just you must do that you must create and in this industry i think that artist collaboration in terms of who you su support and who you are connected with is very powerful because uh, an industry looking at you and you have your sort of entourage and you have your kind of gang of creatives is 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 a powerful thing so i would say just establish establish your own scene and let them come to you as well as you know and they'll notice so that's that's what i i i feel sort of quite passionate that you just don't wait for permission but do it do it do it <laughs> hey I, I would say that's some amazing advice uh and 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 and, uh, and, and, I, and i think i think that that kind of advice can 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 be applied to to, to many things a ver variety Absolute, uh, totally yeah do do stuff you know like what good is sitting alone in your room <laughs> i'd say cabaret was a big influence on me right from very young as well so that's why i'm quoting that but yeah totally of all things to not feel like afraid just that you're as in, you're as vital as the sun you're you're a vital part of this whole existence you know so don't be afraid of like making a fuss making your thing you know without having to think i think about how to monetize it in lots of ways i mean of course that's clever and perhaps you know perhaps i could think like that a bit more but that will come you know just the 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 first thing is to kind of make stuff without that being a pressure on you i think that's my i i don't know yeah i i that's what i'd say <laughs> suki thank you so much for your time uh just being able to talk to you as a fan of your work just uh, such such an honor truly no it's very it's lovely to be asked to speak about um things and and uh, you know and my you know as i'm saying that advice there you are doing exactly that you know you're making something and that's it's brilliant and i'm very flattered that you asked me to speak with you and it's my honor <laughs>